this is such a treat for me. How are you? How have you it's been? It's a treat for me. I'm fine. Thank you. I, I guess you? the last time I saw you was last year. I got to chat you up at the Met we Ball. We were at the Met, that's right. Which yes. was really yes. exciting. See a friendly face. Yeah, and you've been so busy, Colin, doing so many different films. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. But as I was reading about your, your background, which I'm surprised I hadn't met memorized by now, I didn't realize that you actually lived in St. Louis for a time when you were 12 years old because it's you spent true. most of your childhood in England. I was in Nigeria for four years, uh, mostly in England. Yeah, there was St. Louis was a year. Of, uh, I was in eighth grade. And what was that like? Uh, it was actually the best year of my life. It was, a, it was a difficult year because that is an age in which you desperately want to conform. You know, if you're 12 going into 13, you don't, well, I didn't really want to stand out very much. And as a Brit in a, in a suburb of St. Louis, I did. You did? Uh, yeah. Were the kids mean to you, nice to you? Uh, there was a mix. I noticed the ones who were mean more than the ones who were nice. Uh-huh. Uh, and if you called them and said, nah, 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 nah. I've looked for them. <laughs> I'm still scouring the earth. Yeah. But your parents were academic lecturers, is that yes, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, what did, what, so obviously... It was you... a teacher's exchange. Uh-huh. Uh, you can just volunteer that. This is why the, all the travel happened. My father decided to take a job in Nigeria, teaching, and then he thought it'd be interesting to go to America. And... Um, so we swapped with the family. We, you know, we took over their house and their, wherever their schools were and all that sort of thing just for a year. So you, you tr grew up in a very, very academic environment. But I did. you had some trouble in school early on or during periods of your life. Yes, I was the, I was the disappointment in that regard. <laughs> really? I mean, Yes, I mean, my father went to Cambridge and my mother went to Nottingham University and we came from a long line of people who were high achievers. My sister was the, the model of, of following the family line in that respect. And um, no, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't doing any of it. And I wasn't even one of those rather sort of active and uh, you know, re rebels that you can tell exciting stories about. I just was rather lamely not wanting to play along with anything. It, <laughs> You know, I wasn't, um, you know, I, there, were, there was a one crowd who studied and were, the, you know, achieving things, and the other crowd were off sort of hot-wiring cars and taking drugs. And, and so you were sort of fell in the middle? Yeah, yeah, I didn't impress either group. Really. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you decided to pursue a career in acting, were your parents supportive? Yes, they didn't, um, they were alarmed, because nobody in my family had ever met an actor, and... Uh, you know, the, the, the received wisdom is fairly correctly that you don't have a good chance at it. You know, the statistics are not good. And, uh, and we just heard that, you know, my mother used to show, when we were watching a movie on TV, we'd see, see all those people walking in the street in that scene in the city? They're all actors. <laughs> They're all, that's what you'll be doing. <laughs> you'll be the guy, you know, over there, sort of getting out of the cab and walking to it. And, uh, and I believed her, but I thought even that is preferable to a life which feels like these, this classroom, you know, that I'm in. That, uh, I, 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 was, I hated my math class so much that I thought I'd rather be flipping burgers, dreaming of being an actor, <laughs> than sitting at a desk doing all that stuff. Well, it, it, it obviously worked out. When you look back at the trajectory of your career, I guess your first big break was on the London stage, right, Colin? I mean... Yeah. And, and when you look back how one thing led to another, to another, to another, I mean, you must feel incredibly fortunate. Given luck the makes fact luck, yeah. There's so many people out there, and clearly you're, you're very gifted and talented, but there are a lot of people who are gifted and talented that never get anywhere, right? Oh, starting with my own class at drama school. I mean, I, d I, didn't, I didn't even think I was the standout actor in that group of 30 people. And... Um, so that it seems like a profound injustice in my favor. It's quite interesting, you know, people say, why me, a lot. But they very rarely say, why me, when it's good fortune. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, really, so little misfortune has, has hit my life professionally that uh, I, I still don't quite, you know, I'm still waiting for the catch. But, uh, no, one piece of good luck actually just leads to another, and it, it is self-propelling. You know, I, I had to get through a, a big cattle market audition for, my, for the first play. Um, there was something like 10,000 boys auditioning for that one. And um, there was a lot of rather fortuitous things led to my getting noticed there. It wasn't just that I knocked my audition out of the park. But um, once that happened, you're in. I got notice. I know that in a way, uh, even though 
playing Mr. Darcy and Mark Darcy has led to some other great opportunities. In a way, they felt a little bit like an albatross around your neck at, at one point. And, and were you happy to hear that in her latest novel, Helen, Helen Fielding has actually knocked him off? He's died? I don't really believe it until he's buried at a crossroads at midnight with a stake through his heart. <laughs> right? No, I was I... so shocked when I read that, 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 that she was offing him. Does that mean there is no sequel with, with Colin Firth as Mark Darcy? Or do you Don't think count he might... on it. <laughs> do you think he might appear and then... Uh... Listen, you can do whatever you like in a movie. You yeah. know, Tarantino can have Adolf Hitler killed in a cinema somewhere, and we all know that didn't happen. And you can place the movie anywhere in time, so no, I wouldn't count him out. Well, you know, as you know, Colin, and as I've told my staff and most of my friends, you, you are one of my favorite people to interview because I've, I've just enjoyed talking to you so much. But some of my friends got a little concerned when they looked around my house and saw the way it was decorated. Are you aware of that? Yes. <laughs> Well, aware and slightly I'm concerned. No, <laughs> I'm just going to see where you're going. All right. Well, <laughs> let's take a look. This is a picture of my boyfriend, Colin Firth. We've been dating for about four years now. I have met Colin. Oh, sorry. Was that? I'm sorry. Was that? Did I just do that? Hello, Colin. He has that Heathcliffian. Quality, doesn't he? He's kind of dark and brooding. And I like dark and brooding because they're a challenge. You have to make them happy. One of the saddest days of my life was when I saw Colin first wife because she is beautiful. And it was really upsetting. But I'm happy for them, kind of, sort of. <laughs> so I know. We did this as a kind of spoof when I started this show. And I am happy, and I have met Colin's wife, and she is beautiful. And I'm how not dark she? and brooding now. It, <laughs> how, how, is, how is your wife? She's very, very well, thank you. She sends her love. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> no, of course I've seen that. Um, <laughs> I've spent, I spend a lot of time on your website. And, um, <laughs> I'm sure you have, Colin. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's a little bit awkward that we're having to have this conversation in front of witnesses. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, because I think I can actually, I can, I can outdo you. Really? Yes. I mean, I think... Is that your house, Colin? That's my house. <laughs> That's your house. See? See, my mantelpiece. And I, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a continual running theme. This is why I think if everyone could just maybe go get a coffee or something. <laughs> um, no, it's a stipulation whenever I sign a contract. Um, I try to make sure... I don't think... I, I trust nobody's noticed. I've tried to keep it discreet, uh, <laughs> whenever possible. Oh. A, <laughs> that's, that is very link funny. Link you, you'll miss it. So the, the Katie Couric theme is, is, well, that's is very, very much funny. alive in, in, the, in, my, in my professional and personal well, life. Well, thank you. Know. I'm off the cleft. <laughs> I have to tell you, I'm blushing. <laughs> All right, so thank you for being such a good sport. So let's talk about this new film that you're doing, because it's called The Railway Man. And, and tell me what it was that appealed to you about this latest endeavor. I was very conflicted about it when I read the script, um, because on the one hand, I thought this was it's that rare thing, which is a, a piece of history uh, which is immense in its scale. Um, not only in the scale of the numbers of people that were uh, that perished uh, during that time, but also just the, the sheer brutality. Um, it's about as extreme as it gets. So tell us the storyline. This is the, um, it takes place, uh, right. So part of my problem was it was so big, I thought, right. can you actually do this in 90 minutes? That was the problem. But also, it's so big, how can it not be told? And there's a, there's a particular individual whose story this is. Um, he was a man named Eric Lomax, who was captured in Singapore in 1942, along with about 50,000 Allied soldiers. And it was a, a mass capitulation to the Japanese. There was an assumption that, you know, the Japanese would not be capable of such an attack. Uh, it was a, an example of hubris by Imperial Britain, really, colonial Britain. Singapore was the jewel in the crown, and people were living very well there, and it was considered impregnable. People thought that the Japanese wouldn't be able to fly the planes adequately. 
They couldn't do, they couldn't fight in the jungle because they can't see at night, and all these myths. And that they wouldn't be, they'd have to attack by sea because the peninsula's too narrow. All that was wrong. The Japanese could fly their planes, they could fight in the jungle, and they were incredibly effective, and it took seven days for all 50,000 guys to basically surrender, and they were then enslaved um, to build a railway, which was a kind of mass suicidal mission. They wanted to build a railway from Thailand through to Burma and probably eventually to India to keep their supply going for the domination that they planned. Right, and the J J Japanese had been challenged at sea, so they wanted to make this route Yeah, overland. this is a route overland. The British, in fact, in the 19th century, had, had done a, a recce of the area with the thought of building a railway, and as is said in the film, they said, no, this would not only be almost impossible, it would be an act of incredible barbarity, because building a railway costs lives, you know, notoriously. But under those circumstances, I mean, more than 100,000 people died in, in slavery on that railway. And the, 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 the extremes of torture were really unfathomable. And so this man uh, was, uh, I think, 20, 21, when he was captured, and uh, he was put through extraordinary torture. And he survived and uh, came home and bottled it up for decades. Uh, but, of course, when there's suffering on the, to that degree, it creates secondary casualties. It'll affect your family, it'll affect your children, which it did in his life to a very profound extent. And, um, and when he met his wife, Patty, she didn't know a great deal about what he'd gone through, but she could see the damage, and it was affecting their marriage and their relationship. And uh, I think she's as much the hero of the story as anybody. But she encouraged him to get help. She knew that their relationship couldn't survive and that he was dying inside uh, through the, the desire. Because he, he had no other intent, really, in his mind than vengeance. He wanted to find out if any of his captors might still be alive. If they were, he, wanted to go, he was quite simply going to go and kill them. Um, and he wasn't alone in this. An awful lot of veterans of that experience had the same idea. But um, so Patty kind of urged him towards doing something about it, and he discovered by the most remarkable, in real life, the coincidence of discovering the existence of this man is even greater than it is in our film, that one of these guys was alive. I guess his main tormentor, if you will, yes. right? The man who haunted him the most. Um, he was the one of the, in the, during the interrogations who could speak English and so that it was his voice that would wake him up. And he, he, Eric would scream at night every night. And people, would, guests couldn't stay in his house because his, his nighttime uh, screams were too harrowing for people. And um, so that was the, that was the depth of, of, um, of how, how it manifested itself. So he went to find the guy. 